Okay, welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast with me, Sean Anderson, the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media. This is the show where every single week I bring to you stories, accounts, um, histor historical information, as well as the future ideas of some of the most um, successful recruitment leaders in our industry globally. This week, I'm super excited to be joined by Andy Morell. Andy is the CEO. EO of Oscar. Um, Oscar is a technology recruiter with, it, we just hit 100 heads this week on Monday in terms of uh, staff um, across two UK locations, three soon to be four US locations. Um, and he's also a fellow Mancunian um, who deals with the, I think it's actually sunny right now. I can't believe it. And this first time I've recorded a podcast since I moved back, it's not pissing down. Um, <laughs> But uh, we recently caught up in Manchester and uh, I think you'd listen to a few other episodes and, and I decided I thought it'd be a cracker to have you on. So Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. Appreciate it. Yeah, the sun's just popped out now after the electric storm earlier, typical Manchester <laughs> summer. It won't last long, mate. It won't last long. No, I'm sure. <laughs> no. Well, I uh, we got over the technical hic hiccups. If anyone, if you do get any breakups in sound... Um, we've got brand new AirPods at your end, all sorts going on. So bear with yeah. us whoever, if people are listening. Um, yeah, so Andy, I think you can see up my nose from my camera being laid down there. So apologies, my fault. Great it's angle. It's a cracking <laughs> angle, mate. There's not, I haven't got a flattering angle, but this is probably one of the worst. So <laughs> <laughs> if you sneeze, we're going to have all sorts of fun. <laughs> um, well, well, Andy, I've, I've given you a very basic overview there, mate. Do can you do us a favor? Just no, no, we'll go back in a minute, but like give us a a bird's eye view of you in the business right now in a bit more detail yeah. than I can. Yeah, so we, we are predominantly known for technology, but we do have uh, a few other brands as well. So uh, most of them operating uh, more in the States, really. But we, we've got an energy practice, which was historically oil and gas, but we're doing a lot more in the renewable space now as well. And a construction yep. practice that came out organically of energy. Uh, and in the last year, we've also launched digital and life sciences as well. Well, so um, brands are really uh, across STEM, um, but not just technology. But yeah, like you said, born out of Manchester, the business. Um, we went to London a couple of years ago. We went to the States about eight years ago now uh, and, and trying to grow across there as well. Wow. So you, um, those markets are, high, are buoyant markets, aren't they? Like energy, renewables. In, I've heard like renewables in the East Coast of the US is just going crazy right now. You've got life sciences, technology, digital. Yeah. You're, clearly, you're clearly picking sectors that you see some real run, run rate in the future, I imagine. Um, yeah, well, we, we wrote a business plan at the end of our, our 2019, which is the end of August. Uh, and, and growth over a period of three to five years. And we looked at other brands that we wanted to move forward to. We just launched construction, like I said, it, that came organically from a desk, if you like, within energy, sort of right. environment stuff. And and then we wanted to, to look at these other areas that we thought, like you say, high growth, high value, similar feel, candidate short to technology. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, the pandemic just expedited it because people became available that possibly wouldn't normally do. So we yeah. launched we launched digital and life sciences within about six weeks of each other and um, purely because good people came onto the market and no disrespect to us as an employer because i think we are a good destination employer in recruitment but you, you just had to kind of uh, take the gamble really and um, so we, we did it maybe slightly ahead of time um yeah. but yeah yeah put, trying to push forward on a number of different fronts i love it in terms of we'll go we'll go backwards in a minute but Right now, every client I speak to in the market is just going bonkers, right? They're saying it's the busiest it's ever been. And yeah. they're saying they could... One guy said to me, if you could get... I mean, I'm not a rector, right? But he said, if you could get me 30 recruiters today, Sean, I'd hire them. If they were the right... Like, we've we got, like, demand has gone nuts. Like, what are you seeing yeah. right now across the business? Um, so, yeah, demand is high. Um, uh, I mean, I'm... I'm almost 21 years in, in, in recruitment. Most of that obviously tech orientated. It's the busiest I've ever seen it, hands down. Wow. And it has, it's it's really peddled this year. I mean, we, from Ju back in the June to early July last year, we were at higher than pre-pandemic levels, but it's just gone through the roof this year. Uh, it's gone crazy. And I think that a lot of businesses are going back now and trying to hit the, the 2021 graduates because all the rector are telling us, you know, to get a really strong recruiter from tech, 
financial services, etc. Background, it, it's very very difficult. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a bit of a bun fight over good people. I think a lot of people are going back to that organic growth model again after having maybe yeah. a year of trying to pick off some really cool people that maybe were in a bad place with the, the previous company. Yeah, I think there's also, you know, you think about it. If, if you've stuck with a company through the pandemic and if they have treated you relatively well, there's got to be a level of loyalty there, you know, to that company that kept you in a job and kept paying you and... um Unless you were treated really badly, I imagine you know you would want to you'd want to see it through with with a company for a period of time rather than just ditch them for the next job that comes along. I mean, that's just yeah. my mentality. I think, and, and, and obviously, we all appreciate loyalty, and I think there's something in that, but it goes both ways as well, right? I mean, I think if I look at the the, the team that's worked for us for, throughout the last sort of 12, 15 months during these times, they've worked incredibly hard, and they they need a bit of loyalty back the other way as well. Uh, yeah. and I think. You know, I, I think there's fatigue out there for the people that pedaled all the way through as well. Starting to see see signs of that. Talking to other colleagues who run recruitment businesses, you know, the the, the people that have cracked on all the way through, are, are are maybe you know getting a little bit tired um, from that because let's have it right. We've had to work harder in different ways. Um, you know, how many Zoom meetings can you get? You know, um, so I think I think at that point you, people do potentially start to question their environment and. A couple of rep to rep who obviously know the market much better than me are saying that they think there may be movement again of recruiters when people are all back in offices because they've forgotten oh, i didn't really like that commute or i, I thought my, my manager was a bit of an arse or whatever it may be so I, I think that we may start to see movement again but right now i think in those high value markets everybody's making money most people are, are progressing and eating up market share so why would you move right now no, no, agreed. Totally understand that one. Um, and the fatigue piece, I mean, I think, you know, if you have, I haven't had a, any time off since the start of the pandemic. I mean, I've had a little couple of, I've had a one week in July last year where I just went to like the Lake District when we could get out for a bit. Then we got yeah. locked down again when I moved back here. Um, bit of time at Christmas and then I had one week at the start of April. So I've probably had all in all about three and a half weeks maximum of days off since the start of the pandemic. And yeah. I personally feel that fatigue, you know. I'm 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 in, I'm excited now because I feel like we're in a we're on a really cool trajectory, but fucking hell, it's been an odd year. Yeah, it, it has I mean, it, it sounds really glib to a lot of people that have been in a much more difficult position than us, but mm. it has been hard. But I think it's also been very rewarding as well. I think we've all learned hopefully a lot about ourselves and the people around us as well. And hopefully come out of the other side with enhanced environments and cultures and and maybe looking forward to a different future rather than that kind of going back to normal and it being the old normal otherwise that's, yeah. that's a really wasted opportunity of 12 15 months no i completely agree and I, coming to your office in the in the lobby you got them what are they like scooters or bikes or something that they give they're just giving you a way to scoot around town and yeah there's the scooters downstairs there's brompton bikes outside um, I'm not sure bit, I'm I don't know. trusted on those, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just think there's a vibe though, like you know, it's almost like that. It's exciting to go into an office a couple of days a week, two, three, whatever your model is, and we'll talk about that. Um, offices putting on things like that. I mean, we just signed up to the Global WeWork Pass, which is yeah, it's only like a couple of hundred quid ahead. So I was in London on Thursday, met with some of the team. I mean, Manchester's WeWork on Friday, and um. I like the fact I can just drop in a couple of times a week. I don't have to be there, but it, I don't know. I feel like there's a really cool ability. There's, a, there's some exciting stuff ahead of us. Let's go back with you, Andy, because you 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 worked as a you got you you worked your way up to being the leader of a contract recruitment division for a previous employer, yeah. and then 14 years ago, you shifted and basically took over Oscar. Um, can yeah. you take us back to that? Like, what was your life like in say a couple of months before? And why did that all, how did it all happen? Um, so my life was hell of a lot simpler then. Um, <laughs> di didn't have wife or kids. I had a, a nice little apartment living with my mate in, in Didsbury, which is, I'm sure you know, yeah. it's a suburb of South Manchester. Great yeah. place for young professionals. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I was having a great time, you know. Um, I've got a contract division around me of every... I actually trained either directly or from a secondary or tertiary perspective, everybody under me, which was yeah. great. So that there's the, immediately that buy-in culture, you all get each other. Um, and 
I was probably getting a little bit, a little bit bored, a little bit antsy about kind of what was next. At that, at the time, that organisation, it was, it was made not explicitly but implicitly clear that, that, that there's not going to be anything greater, you know, sort of a director level role or sort of you know um, ownership or anything like that. So, I was probably having a little bit of a think about what to do. I had a couple of interviews, nothing was quite right. You know, you consider that sort of setting up yourself. Mm -hmm. Um. I think, to be honest with you, I I, I, I became I, I became really engaged with recruitment when I started coaching and managing people more so than yeah. when I was just a biller, and the thought of going back to that sort of doing it from your bedroom on your own scared the pants off me because I just thought that's not actually playing to my strengths. Yeah, um, and yeah, yeah. you know, looking back now, whether that's a choice you make, I don't know. But so, so yeah, so things are going along quite nicely, and the the owners of that business were also founders of of Oscar. Um, there'd been a, a guy who'd gone and set that up in 2001 who'd previously been sort of senior in the business I was at and um, for one reason or another the, the company hadn't really grown I think it started with quite a bit of promise but think about the starting a tech orientated recruitment agency in 2001 we just had Y2K dot first dot com bubble had burst you're way too young to remember all this uh, and we just had 9-11 as well right 9-11 yeah, yeah. as well so um, it was a really tough time in tech. I mean, it was a tough time for me to get into recruitment late 2000 I did. And the market was really difficult until probably January 20, 2004. Um, yeah. So th at the time, I wasn't there, but as I understand it, the, the guy who was running Oscar, he sort of branched out into multidisciplinary stuff. So by the time I got there in early 2007, there's like, there like a couple of people doing rail, a couple of people doing oil and gas couple of people doing IT and a couple of people doing rec to rec and that was it. It's a small handful of people. And um the guy who ran it had, had fallen out with the, the other um, the other family shareholders and, and he had to be removed. And th they were looking for somebody to run it. I think they probably knew I'd hit a glass ceiling where I was. Um so I think it was like the first year of Friday. I said, look, do you fancy it? I was like, oh yeah, maybe. I I, I didn't I didn't know a lot about it. I knew it was small, knew it wasn't as sex, so successful as we were, so I was I'm not really sure. Came back on Monday, said, right, I need a decision. I said, yeah, do you know what? Let's go for it. Parachuted me on Tuesday. Um, we kind of interviewed everybody in there to find out what they thought of it and, and, and stuff, and then they left and that was it. Shut the door and I was on my own. <laughs> so how many people were there? It was a handful, single figures. Yeah. So what? Um, but with you know, within a very short period of time of me being there, half of the ones that were there left right. pretty much immediately. Um, there'd been the people there were quite loyal to the previous MD, and I understand that because I think yeah. you know influential leaders do garner that kind of loyalty. So, and because I was coming from the place where the other founders were, um, and, and they'd sort of had one side of the story of that fallout, I think they assumed that I was going to be this kind of evil dictator and um I, I suppose there'd been a stigma attached to me before they'd even met me uh and when you're going in somewhere and you're trying to without sort of wanting to serve too much disrespect to the people that they're ready but trying to turn something into a proper business with structure uh, with unified processes with a set commission structure with a, a crm system that people use um, you know it's enforcing that change is very difficult when people have been told this dude's the devil coming in um so <laughs> It, so it was, I mean, realistically, the, the business pretty much started again. Uh, we were in how a... Did, how did you... What was the first thing you do then? You said you interviewed everyone, understood the lay of the land, and, yeah. and like you say, some people yeah. move on. So you're left with a ha small yeah. handful. Yeah. Um, did you get given, like, a, a big budget to play with or anything like that? How, how did you think about um, growing it? it? It was all organic. It, it was it was all make, turn it into... It was a loss-making loss business. Turn it into a money-making business, and, and we can grow. And... We, I was very, very fortunate at the time. There were two guys, both called Matt, um, one, one an oil and gas recruiter, one an IT recruiter, still really young and really junior, but um, we kind of saw potential as a rock. We could build around these guys. So we got rid of everything else and we built it around IT, oil and gas. Uh, and the, the, both of the, those guys became directors of the business eventually. Um, one Matt moved on. He's, he's, he, he's got a great career elsewhere in recruitment now. And the other Matt, who we built IT around, is our UKMD now. Um, wow. So I, we, I think we identified, and I had to say, look, trust, trust me, this is going to work because obviously, you know, they, they say that they're in the same boat as everybody else. They see him come in. I've spoken to a couple of people that kind of left 
almost immediately without giving me or the new leadership a chance. And a couple of them possibly regret it, or even if they don't regret going, I think they see now that things weren't necessarily as they thought they were going to be, and the business has done well eventually. What What was your mindset like? What was your at that point? Because I'm sure you've changed yeah. a lot. I'm sure there's some similarities, but I'm sure you've learned a yeah. lot. But back then, yeah, how would you sum up your kind of approach to leadership in that at that time? I think as a I was um, 27, 28, something like that at the time, and I think as a kind of high spirited young man who is quite a lot of background in sport, I think that's why I took to that leadership. I think I was probably more one dimensional than I am now in terms of my management style. It was very much that kind of captain of the team, grab us all together, we'll drink together, we'll, we'll win together, we'll lose together, which is great. And there are elements of that that, that, that remain. Um, but I think it was definitely looking back now very one dimensional, very passionate, very, very positive. I've always been very fair. I've always been the opinion as a leader. You'd never ask anybody to do something you won't do. And you've got to demonstrate that from the front. And I think if people know you've got their back, they will, they will, they'll run through brick walls with you. Um, yeah. And I think it's really difficult to go in somewhere and make that apparent very quickly because you're trying to raise standards. They don't know you to be able to trust you to, 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 to want to do it for you. And one of the big things I've said to, to my managers over the years that work underneath me is it's, it's not just teaching the people underneath you the right techniques, the right recruitment processes. It's, it's having them want to do it for themselves, for you and for the vision. There's got to be purpose there as well. And that's really important. And, and, yeah, I think I think um, at the time I was just like, look, I can't let this fail. This is, you know, I, I don't want uh, a negative on, on my my career on my CV. Um, and yeah, I think we just threw ourselves at it. And, and there, there's been kind of lots of eras during my time, at Oscar, based on different things. Um, we moved to Manchester in the January, so we were in Didsbury, spitting yeah. sawdust office above, above a boozer and a, a terror shop and all that kind of stuff. The office was disgusting. The carpet was a mess. It was, you know, it, it wasn't a cool place to bring people in. You know, if you want to get the best graduates, you know, um, it was great for me because I lived two minutes away. I thought we to look if we're going to have any ambition over this, we need to move to Manchester. We need to go yeah. to the city centre so we can attract people from the other areas. That why would you go past the city centre if you're from North Manchester to go down to Didsbury? It's lovely as it is, right? Yeah. You know, you, you might capture yeah, people yeah. from Stockport or around there, but you know, we need to be central. So moved into the city centre, signed a ten year lease on the place we just moved out of actually. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Got a big space. You're still, so look, we're finishing it. Actually, when I Googled you and when I went to your old building, I don't know if you've changed that now, but about a month ago, I, I went there and he that's goes, right, oh, no, yeah. they've moved. They're just around the corner. The guy on reception, yeah. he knew you straight away. Yeah. Um, that's that's incredible. And the thing is, even though it wasn't a startup in terms of you didn't sit there in your underpants, and I mean, it's a startup, right? There's four or five people or whatever. There's you coming in. That, that kind of on-the-pitch leader, I think, so important. I mean, from my experience of running teams and then building Hoxo and now building up the academy, because I've I've got five people in the academy at the moment. It feels, you know, I'm on the pitch yeah. with them every day. It's kind of, yeah. it's a really important skill set. But you, I look, I'm excited to find out how you've evolved it. One question I have though: Did you do deals at that point? Did you go back, or did you at four, five, six, seven people? Were you just literally focusing so on it? Yeah, so I was advised by the the, the, sort of the founders of that business, go in, just run it. You don't have time to do a desk. I think looking back now, I think I would have been better showing. I think people believe you when they see it, right? You know, I mean, it's most common sort of misconception of non-billing managers that they can't do the job anymore, right? It's, people look at that job as the, as the great, just the utopia, isn't it? Getting off the phones. And um, I actually remember a circumstance where, so we didn't have anybody doing contract tech recruitment with these, these two people doing per Matt and Andy to begin with. And we there was a, a, a contract opportunity and I said, look, guys, I can do this, I'll do it. And I made a placement, I did a trial start, made a placement, I said, that's a, that's a deal. And we've not even sent a CV, so it's a deal done. And I think that that was a bit of a moment where I think people went, actually, this guy might not be full of shit. He might actually know his stuff. And I think that probably changed the mindset a little bit. I think having that ability to be able to show people rather than tell people is important. But if you if you don't have that opportunity and you are on billing, you just simply have to improve people's lives. They have to feel and, and genuinely that you, without you being there, they would be doing worse. They'd be worse off for the results or they wouldn't be as happy. Um, they wouldn't be as skilled. And I think once you start to have, you, you know, you help people 
typically then uh, in, in nuanced situations, right, you know, I've got this problem with this client or this candidate. I think once you can make sense of that for people, and you, you, if they are coming to you with something, it means there's a problem, so you're not going to win every one, and you have to understand yeah. that. But they have to go away thinking, well, at least that was the right decision. And quite often people don't appreciate that because, you know, you always kind of think that you know best, right? Because we're all quite headstrong. Uh, but I think it's all about improving people's, their perception of how well they're doing, um, be it directly or indirectly. Um, but it is, it's harder to do without showing people billing. I, I, I truly believe that. Yeah, I, think, I, think billing manager, I think billing managers are, are absolutely like gold dust. Um, but it can sometimes be more difficult when you move into that non-billing position. I'm sure. I'm sure lots of people are going to have lots of tears for that, you know, because they're smallest violin in the world, time, right? But um, it's, it's a tough kick. I'm interrupting this episode of the Rag Podcast to bring you a message from our sponsor, Audro. You know by now that Audro are the number one video interview platform for recruiters around the world. Now they keep bringing out new features, from Audro Capture to Audro Producer. And it just keeps getting better and better and better. But now, recently, they've just announced a new feature to the platform, which is a complete game changer. During COVID-19, they realized that the recruitment audience, the communication was changing. Globally, their clients and candidates were, were using Microsoft Teams and Zoom more than anything else. The phrase, let's jump on a Zoom call or jump on a Teams call, has actually replaced the, the words video interview for a lot of their conversations over the last six months. Now, they were thinking, do we, I mean, how are we going to er eradicate this? How are we going to make Audro the name that everyone talks about for, for the interview process? And they realized they didn't need to. They needed to integrate. So for the first time ever, they, they're the first video interview platform on the planet that have decided and managed to integrate with Zoom and soon to be integrated with Microsoft Teams. So with one click, after recording a Zoom video, you can now drag that into Audro and create everything else that Audro has from adding the CV, the heat maps, the capture, and the producer elements. You get all the benefits of Audro before and after the interview, but you get to use Zoom, which is client friendly on all levels. So this is massive. Teams is coming. It's the first time anyone's ever done it in our sector, and it is literally going to change the way you work in 2021. Get in touch with my friends over at Audro at audro.co.uk, or if you're already a user, reach out to your account manager to make sure you've got this feature. Back to the show. Well, I, I went from top biller to team leader to manager, and then and in a manager role, I started I was a bit similar to you, really. I had my, my team of six, and then I oversaw the other two teams of similar. So there's about 18 of us, which I, I was ultimately responsible for. And I found it really difficult because I was a bit of a superhero manager where I'd jump in and fix it. And, you know, I found I was I was doing deals through people. So I was getting a client call a job in or, or getting a job, passing it to a member of the team, telling him which candidates to ring and then helping him close, like do the whole thing. And then yeah. I thought I was coaching them, but really I just kept doing the bit. Like, And then they were writing on the yeah. board. And when I stood back as a manager and didn't do that, I realized they're not that good, some of these people. So yeah. I made, made, made the same company. mistake. Made the yeah. same mistake. I think there's a lot to that. I think there's there's a, a bit of a, a control freak element to that, isn't there? I mean, I because mm -hmm. when I went to, when I went to Oscars, sort of this MD, you know, um, you feel like every single thing that goes out the door's got your name on it. Yeah. So you become quite attached to that, and it can be the same thing if it's your your team or your division or or you know or your projects or have. You. And I, I feel like that was one of the, the biggest things I found it hard to let go. And I, one of the things that I did learn, it took me quite a few years to learn this. I was, and people say, you know, you get the interview, people go, oh, what's your weaknesses? People say, oh, perfectionist, because they're trying to spin to yeah. a positive. And that definitely is a weakness. It's the, you know, it's the enemy of good, right? Um, and I I was definitely guilty of that, you know, the tiniest little thing. I wanted everything to be perfect because I wanted us to have these super high standards. And it was, it didn't come from a bad place. But looking back now, you know, must be probably difficult, quite difficult to work for, for me. Um, and I think you, you learn o over the years, that actually, if, if I've said this on another podcast, if you actually want maximum output, it's not about getting everybody to be a 10 out of 10 recruiter. 
if you if the things that we'd have to do you know you train people manage them to get them to 10 out of 10 you've, you've got to really put people through the mill if that means their their want to do the job has waned to a two or three out of ten your output is ten times three ten times two whereas if we can comfortably get them to seven or eight and go, they will find their own way to get the nine or ten their want to do the job will remain at a seven eight nine ten out of ten so you got seven seven forty nine is more output than ten times two right and I think that it yeah, takes probably. a while to get your head around that a little bit because, mm. you know, I, I look at our staff now, right? We're, we're doing record numbers month on month, quarter by quarter, the UK and the US. Being perfectly honest, there's no disrespect to our guys now. They're not suddenly just massively better technically at the job than maybe the guys were that we had eight or 10 years ago. But we've learned to evolve into an environment that people want to stick around in and want to progress in. Um, and, and I think that's really, really important. You know, um, you, you, you take people in any area of performance because we are, you know, we're in a meritocratic industry where performance is very much related to the way that we're judged, be it different businesses, sport or what have you. If people are doing it with a smile on their face or at least they understand the purpose, that's better than them being 10 out of 10 technically. Yeah, I agree. I think I, I've I've always had an issue. and I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know your opinion on this is, I'm learning in my personal life. I've got a coach at the moment. I'm learning to not judge, right? And try and see a, every situation from the, try and put myself in the shoes of the other person. And I yeah. think I'm finding it easier in, re, in personal life than in work. And, and if I look back at my recruitment days, I was shocking for this because when someone's giving you the whole, you know, this is why I've not been able to get hold of that client for the, for the third time. You know, I'm already judging that they're lazy, bullshit, full of like. I, I'm, I'm, cre I'm already creating in my head a picture before I've listened yeah. to the truth. And everyone's at different levels. Do you ever find that where you've, or, or how have you managed to overcome that where you're, you're truly listening to people and not taking your, your own experience and that kind of ego sometimes? Because that's what I think it falls yeah. down to, and and put it laying that on people that haven't got you the same experience as you. Mm. I think don't forget part of that time that will be right sometimes it yeah. will be um so let's not forget that our because we, we're doing that from learned experience it doesn't mm. mean it's always wrong but it, it, it it's certainly not always right as well so some of my issues are places that are really massively kpi focused and really just about metrics it's like the answer is just do more just do more so if if i'm not getting results now i'm just going to do more stuff that doesn't get results it's then actually get the same crap results and it's exhausting right and yeah. i think that comes down to an assumption of, of how you got to that place for me you know we got say with we're, we're touching on uh, 100 staff at the moment we get over that number on monday i can't know every individual but every individual's line manager or stakeholder or support person will know them and they will understand why they can't get hold of that candidate for the third time and it's really important to know that i think it's really easy on the outside looking in go okay somebody's doing zero at this or what have you make the assumption straight away oh they're lazy that, that that might be true but it also could sometimes won't be further from the truth i think it's it's, it's making sure that you've got network and there's pillars within the organization so that people do really understand that i mean I, i'm a big fan of um creating processes but if you create processes you can have creativity around that and within that and i think that the again you know I, I can't possibly know every one of our staff intimately that, you know, I try to get to know them as much as possible in terms of sort of, you know, partners and, and kids and, and, and interests, because I think sometimes that can give you a nine. But ultimately speaking, the reality is now for me, it's, it's not for me to make the decision. It's not for me. It's not even my call to say whether the lazy or not. It's the person that I've entrusted to be their support, their manager, to go into their directors coming to me. So yeah. I don't. I don't have to walk around like the big bad wolf and stroll around and go and get on the phone or any of that kind of stuff because it's not my job. Yeah. We, we, if I do that, I'm treading on the toes of the people that do that job properly and they're making less assumptions because they know the people that sat around so all day long, you know, three days a week, whatever it is at the moment, but they know them inherently better than I do. And it's my yeah. job to know the people that, that report into me and, and to listen to what they're saying about their, their staff, their people, their projects, their markets. I like it. So if we go back to sort of the, the growth of the business from a handful to a hundred, yeah. uh, like what, 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 I guess, what are the key milestones in memory that you would, you would say stand out the most in, on that trajectory curve in terms of headcount or events? Is there something that early days you can remember that sticks out? 
there's, there's a few things that, that that stick out to me in terms of areas. I mean, um, obviously, when I get there, financial crisis time, right? You know, um, 2007, 2008, we really hit us till 2008 till 2010, 2011. At that point, it was really difficult if you were doing anything that was UK orientated. Um, mm. Luckily enough, at the time, the oil and gas um, piece for us was making a lot of money because it was dictated by the oil price rather than the, the UK economy, the American economy, whatever. Uh, so it's obviously those things are, are linked uh, but not necessarily uh, in a linear fashion. So the oil and gas was 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 making parts of money, and the tech guys were scratching around for business because no one had any money to spend in the UK. So you have that spell there, and then later on, which the, that's not necessarily the next year, but later on, 2015, 2016, when the oil price crashes beyond belief, the tech guys are holding them up. So it's balanced a lot of the time through history, you know, UK doing well, US struggling the other way around. Um, and, and, and I think that's how that helps in many ways, because it helps me to get risk because you have got that balance. But at the same time, it's you don't it's very unusual to have every every part of the business firing completely at the same time. And, and that is the challenge. I think we're the closest to that right now. But it, like anything, the, the growth wasn't straight line. You know, no. you, you get you get to your. 20 to 30, uh, and lots of people have said this, I agree. That's a, that's a bit where you can plateau for a while. And then we plateaued again around 50, 60 for quite a while. And then we we probably we plateaued around sort of 80 to 90 for the last sort of 12 months, really trying to grow, um, but, but only doing that on a net basis incrementally. Um, yeah. But there's, you know, the, the, the different areas, different parts of the business, um, have pushed on. We we had to get the right leader in the US, which was crucial for us. Kevin, who's our MD over there, he started with us as a trainee in Manchester, and we tried a couple of local leaders who knew the US market, who again particularly had decent background in in the energy industry, but it it, it wasn't the right job for them. And I think we were um, what's the word? I, th I think I think we're blinded a little bit by big numbers from an organizations where the manage big accounts that we didn't have yeah. um and things like that but the, so the us really has gone firing in the last couple of years and massively so and i think it's, that's very very important because a, a lot of my mates who are in recruitment in the uk and now are now doing the us from the uk with the plan to go over there when the embassies open up and get e2s and stuff like that so i think we have a window of opportunity that is short before everybody catches up now and we're so two thirds staff in the UK, a third in the US. That'll balance out, I think. I think that yeah. within the next eighteen months, I think it'll be fifty fifty. Um, and exciting. yeah, it is exciting. Um, and I, I say we, we're we're lucky we've got an advantage of being over there. We were a little bit hampered in the states because when we first got over there, we won a we won an RPO. It was a mini RPO with uh, one of our oil and gas clients and the small office that we just set up in Houston. It ended up pretty much completely being a delivery center into this one account and we'd never yeah. won an rpo before we'd never been in the states before so all of these new things happened at once and at, at the end of this project a couple of years later it was great we'd run a load of contractors through it um but the, the people in there had forgotten how to get new business because they'll be delivering to this one account we had a couple of a couple of people went embedded on the client site you know kind of went native went over to sort of work for them and things like that and big learning curve and you know you look back and you think oh crikey we had we've had a long time there relative to our growth and we've only really got going that last two or three years where i feel like the lessons of everything before that started to become realized by us and we're actually utilizing it for good to evolve and get better it's it's, it's i said this to somebody the, the other week you know i've been at oscar 14 years you know i've, I've seen you you um you interview and have podcasts with people that have been going a good five six years and they've got as, as, as much growth as us and it feels like we kind of we're an overnight success after the previous 12 years graph beforehand and then it's all sort of started to come together and i think mm -hmm. that's what as we've changed as humans as well and the, in the leadership team i've started to, to, to learn how to put some of the the, the experiences to good use really a final interruption to today's episode to introduce Vincere. Vincere is the all-in-one CRM ATS platform built for the recruitment and staffing industry. Now, I first heard about these guys about a year ago. The amount of prospect 
recruitment agencies and clients I was working with that were telling me they were moving over to Vincere, I had to look into it. And what I found was a business that had a global reach um, with multiple offices around the world. So they've got this follow the sun methodology, which allows them to support recruitment businesses wherever you are and, have, and, and be in your time zone. But the technology that they've invested in um, is becoming a, a disruptor in the space. More and more recruitment businesses are doing this to give their, their recruiters a competitive advantage. They broke into the G2 Crowd's momentum grid as a market leader based on their reviews from their customers. So the, the agencies that are using this platform are raving about it. Now, if you're a rag listener and you're thinking about changing CRM or you're a new business looking to launch with a new CRM, then I would get in touch with, the, with these guys because if you mention that you're a rag listener, they're doing an amazing deal. By visiting www.vincere.io forward slash rag, you can get an exclusive deal which offers two months completely free on a two-year commitment or three months completely free on a three-year commitment. This applies to all licenses that you've either signed up for now or that you'll add in the duration of the contract. So get on there and have a look. Finally, if you're listening to your recruiter and you're thinking, I want to move into a more of a business development role um, and I'd like to keep hold of my recruitment knowledge. Well, these guys are recruiting for a BD person, well, multiple roles in both Sydney and London right now. So if you've got a strong recruitment background, you want to move into BD and you want to work for a fast moving tech business that's helping people like you right now, then get in touch via their website because they're hiring today. Back to the show. You've made a point there I wanted to touch on anyway, and it's around patience and seeing a bigger long game. Like, you know, I think as an industry, yeah. we're quite short sighted, aren't we? Really? Let's be let's be honest. As an industry, yeah. uh, we're, we're people that we we're always even me now, you know, I'm looking at my business in the next four weeks and thinking, fuck, I've got things to do here. Um yeah. I know where I want to be 12 months, two years, three years on a on a high level, but I'm bu I'm built as a person to 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 focus on the next thing that's coming and yeah um you know how how have you managed to and have you managed to become more of a patient leader and to think like for example what you said before it's very rare all the business is firing like instantly I'm thinking you know my hair's grey I'll be getting more grey the more that parts of the business are underperforming um. And I've only ever had one business unit. I've now got two. So I can I can kind of see where you I'm gonna go down that route. So yeah. I guess two questions. How do you cope with that v v uh, variety or um what's the word I'm looking for? That um unpredictability in 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 success in each team. And then also how do you keep yourself thinking long term and having the patience? Because you know, some people would have given up if you'd not got to where you are in 12 years. Yeah, well, first of all, I'll snap your hand off for any grey hair if you can lend me some. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> um, um, I think look, for me, we we I I only appreciated the importance of long-term vision three or four years ago. Right. Um, having never had a mentor, having never been taught by anybody, we were just just peddling. Well, we get incrementally better. Everyone's got a better life, right? And and I think what you're missing there is purpose. And what yeah. you're missing there is is that bigger vision for everybody to buy into. Because I never needed one when I was younger, not because I'm super motivated or anything. Because it was just it was all about me. What I wanted to do, earn more money, go up the career career path. Truth is, didn't really give a shit about what the company was doing. My first business, and yeah, mm. I, I liked it because I liked the people there. But it was about me within it, right? Um, yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. I'm an overly selfish person, but I just think that's the way a lot of people feel in the industry. And then, you know, start to look around, start to talk to all the recruitment leaders via networks, RDLC, other places like that, that I've become a member of and, and stuff that I was very cynical about. You start to realize actually, that you, you know, you learn stuff and you need bigger picture and you need people to buy into that. And I think I was always thinking, well, what's the point in writing a three or five year business plan? Because we all know within 12 months, something happens because we've had all these events we've seen, whether it's 9-11 or the financial crisis or the oil price crash or the dot-com bubble bursting or something else or something else. Brexit. Um, the pandemic, COVID. Um, yeah, COVID. But, but you, you need to have these things in place because it's okay to flex from it. It's like it's like I was saying before about with the, with the working environment. Um, you need process to be able to have true creativity, or it's just chaos, you know. Um, and I think that you have to have the same thing with a plan. And I think people want to believe in that now. And I think I think it's, I think purpose. Good recruits can earn good money anywhere, right? Let's be honest; they don't need me. They can earn that anywhere. 
But if they share our purpose and they buy into our goal longer term, they might stay with us. And if they know that, then this is a big part of it, that they're going to be part of that fabric and it's going to be just as important to them as it is to us or me. You know, it's, I've seen a couple of quotes on, on LinkedIn where they say, you know, don't, there was one today, don't, don't expect the people to, who work for you to care as much about the business as you. And I kind of agree with that, but I also kind of disagree with it as well. I think if the people around you, no matter from, from you know, an administrator to the cleaner through to the directors, if everybody believes in that pathway, it sounds really cheesy, but they, they believe in the vision and they feel like they've got purpose within that, then the short term stuff is fine because they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll forgive those shitty days. You know, those tough months is OK because we've got we, we're going somewhere and we're going together and we're on this ride. And I, I think I overlooked that for many years. And I think I, I look at things two ways. I, like you, I'm built to, to look at short term goals. You know, it, uh, again, if you look after the days, the weeks will look after themselves. If you look after the weeks, the months will. If you look after the months, the quarters yeah. will. Look after the quarters, the years will. And I think you have to have both. I think you have to have you have to keep an eye on the here and now, because if you do let things um fester if, if it's not going well if you're not looking at it on a regular basis you're missing out on a chance to change it if things mm. are going well we have a habit of um of analyzing when things go wrong analyze when things go right so that then you can you can spread that out amongst other people that may not understand why or how or different business units and things like that so i think you've got to keep looking at that but I, it's it's having urgency when you're panicking if you're struggling and if things are going well it's it's not taking your feet up because you look, we've still got to get to that goal up there that we want to get to in three years' time. You know, we 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 were really fortunate during the pandemic by accident, right? Completely by accident, be honest. So um we'd had our two best years didn't take dividends out of the company because we were concerned about Brexit. So yeah. I don't really know what's gonna happen with Brexit. How am I gonna know if the politicians didn't know, right? Mm. Um so we left this the money in the business so we were very very liquid then the pandemic happened so that's the one thing that allowed us over that last 12 months where we could go right, let's go and hire a load of senior recruiters let's build let's build a couple of new brands when a lot of places were let's just keep our head above water now yeah. okay it may have been prudency just to keep it in there because of brexit and then it's in there anyway so there is some there is something planned with that but we didn't know that this this alien virus was going to come and, and, and knock everybody out of the water so you, you can adapt and you change um and it then changes the plan somewhat but the vision's still there we still know where we where we want to get there how it may you, have just brought it forward or pushed it back a little bit how do you sum up, summarize the vision that you've got tell us what what's the kind of overarching vision that you see for oscar yeah, so, and, and this is one of the things where, again, being perfectly honest, we really struggle because there are businesses out there where I, I, I know, you know, there's there's a couple that's seen this year, or they're all about sustainability. You know, it's it's all about that, or they're all about, um, you know, um, doing X, Y, and Z in in this brand new way. I think I've always struggled with the concept of reinventing the wheel in recruitment. I, I really have. I know there's lots of people doing really cool stuff now. Uh, you know, around talent as a service models or productizing and, and, and lots of really, really cool things. Becoming true consultancy as a result of IR35 and things like that. For me, we it's we, we aren't like really kind of um, tunnel visioned into this, this vision. We're going to be the best at X, Y and Z. But we're really, really passionate about quality across the board. Um, and, and that's not an explicit vision, of course. But we, we've always struggled with the kind of like this this one thing that we're really, really good at. I think we're, we're very human and I think we're very down to earth. And I think we, we try to be very progressive. We're trying to consistently evolve and to, and to get to that point. So we, we're rewriting the business plan now for the end of this financial year. So end of August, start of September. And we're going to re-release that again to, to, the, to the staffing body. And it, every time we do it, it goes down really well. But it changes dramatically from the last one. Mm. You know, it really does. The values don't change. The company evolves. You know, we, uh, we've gone to a hybrid working model. We, we're now in the UK. We're on 1 p.m. finishes all summer uh, as a trial. If that goes well, that's going to be for good. On a Friday? Or... Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. of the finishes on a Friday for the next four months uh, until September. And I've said that if we if we hit X amount of billings, you keep it forever. Um, mm. the, the, US, the US already do uh, half day finishes on Friday because they would. When we went over there, we aligned the hours to the oil and gas industry. 
Um, so we, we, we're constantly trying to just inch forward in different ways. Um, and I think that what we have is very good, quite young leadership team of people who are still peddling and still really passionate about it. And the vision comes from what they tell me rather than what I tell them, if you know what I mean. I think that's really important. Do you do you do you think that there's a lot of talk about launching in the US, right? It seems to be yeah. You hear you hear this, you know, you go over there, an average recruiter in the UK, you're gonna double your income. Like what is the truth around running a business, especially the complexity of having two entities, one in the US, one in the UK? What yeah. how would you give us your overview on that? I think well t- 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 I think if you want me to 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 answer whether I feel that statement's true or not about the US. Yeah. I think that the recruitment industry over there, as we know it, is probably slightly less mature than it is here. So I think there is the ability to, for some relatively low hanging fruit, at some things I think they're more advanced than us in a lot of areas in the way that we do recruitment, possibly not. And because the US is so big, you know, one of the reasons I believe, and again, you know, there's, there's nothing technical in it, but um, I think the UK is such a small com- com- country it's made recruitment so competitive that then augurs into innovation because it's got to be because you've got to stay ahead of your competition right mm-hmm. the us being so big and being so disparate it's not it's not had necessary innovation and and i, I think that if you go over there and expect to work in the same ways you've worked here and to make oodles of cash you, you, you're going to be bitten on the bum very very quickly but that doesn't mean that the average fees aren't higher because they are the average percentage you've got out there is higher uh, last month, we averaged forty-five thousand dollars ahead in the US, wow. um, which is three. Well, no, transfer UK. We averaged, I think, it was about sixteen or seventeen thousand sterling ahead. So, and, and those, I think, those numbers are pretty okay, right? But yeah, it, they it's are. Yeah, been, it's sure. not. It's, it's not always been like that, and it won't always be like that. And I think that you've got to understand local custom. You've got to understand socio-political environment, which changes city by city, never mind state by state. The different yeah. laws, you know, particularly if you're if you're going to get into contract stuff between W two and ten ninety nine and blah blah blah, you know, and it and, and cooked up and it and it goes on. And I think it's like any, it's like people go, oh, get into crypto, you make a shitload of money, right? The people that will get into it who invest the time into doing it properly will make more money and will grow uh, infinitely. But the people who are just doing it because they think it's easier, no, it won't happen. And no. um, we've had guys who've gone over there that have absolutely flown we've got others who've gone over there probably for the wrong reasons the lifestyle thinking it'll be easy and they've struggled you know not everybody yeah. can be the best and and it's like anything you go into it with the right attitude and i think with the right diligence you'll be okay but it's not it's not just shooting fish in a barrel like i think is probably pushed out there by certain parties yeah so how managing that from i know you've got an md in in both locations yeah. Was that always the case, or how did you get how did you get it off the ground? You talked about that first office in the RPO. How did you manage that? Did you have to fly over? Like, what was going on? So, um, at the time, at the time, um, I was concentrating my day to day stuff on the UK recruiters, um, and one of my fellow directors sort of led the the launch of that. Um, I, I'm, I try. I wanted to get over four times last year, once a quarter, and I managed the first quarter, and then I, I couldn't get over. Um, but I'm trying to give huge autonomy to my leaders. Um, I, I want to have input because otherwise, again, I'm not improving their lives. What's the point of them needing me, right, if I don't have input? But um, as Kevin states, I try to give him a huge breadth. Um, you know, he, he's a bit like Brian Clough, and I don't know if you've heard the, the old kind of thing, but like, yeah. we'll, he'll come to me with an idea. I'll, I'll probably give him reasons why it's not right, and then we'll agree to do what he wants. So, so uh, which is, he's, he's, he's very, very good at what he does. Um, so I tried to be there to support. I think one of the challenges that I've had and what the business has had is keeping internal communications well. I know that there's been times when uh, London as well has sometimes felt like second fiddle to HQ in Manchester because I'm there, it's easy to direct stuff from there, and you can sometimes get caught up in, in local stuff. Oh, this is great in Manchester now. Let's do this, you know. Um, and I think one of our challenges and challenges of our new marketing manager, and our new marketing team that we've built recently, is to keep everybody internally feeling like they are just as important to Oscar. And I think we're getting a lot better at that. And I think having a leader over there, Kev, who's been there well, maybe three years now, who has sort of come from the mothership 
helps that massively. If you've got a leader that is, is alien to the business, you've got yeah. another variable that you, you need you need to make them feel feel cool as well as the people need them and, and try and make sure that although things should be different locally, be it the, the you know the, the hours they work or the, the way that they do certain processes, you you still want it to be a little bit like that, you know, the McDonald's thing where a Big Mac should taste the same anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah, you want yeah. to you want to give all of your client and candidate experiences that same level of excellence. However, there should be different ways of doing it. You know, I, I know we're doing well when a local office or team has got their own culture and it's their culture, but the performances are to the same level. And that's really, really important. And I think that's difficult when you've got uh, a handful of staff. I, I feel like London, we've been there a couple of years. We're only getting going now because we're sort of, you know, sort of, um, 13 staffers in next week. You know, it, it, it's really difficult underneath, under that. And then I think one of the, challenges is particularly when they're far flung and you can't all be together all the time because what you don't want to do is get 100 people on a zoom and talk about how the uk has done this week how the US has done that because people switch off but yeah. you do need to have connectivity so how um, do you manage that what the, what is that kind of overarching comms and then the, how does it then infiltrate to local comms yeah so again we're working on that at the moment so we just so we we just we we've had marketing outsourced the last few years. We had it insourced, outsourced it uh, to Marmalade, who were brilliant. But we've just insourced it again recently, and we've we've got two marketing executives that work under the marketing manager, and we've assigned them brands each, including internal comms. So we've given them responsibility for that because I do feel like it's something that's been missed out on. And it, I suppose it's a number of different things. It's making sure that people are aware of the rest of the business and how that how well they're doing, and and it's. It's also something as simple as sharing sales information for so that people have those guys over there, they've got my back. You know, US companies hiring people in the UK and things like that. Um, and uh, you know, you, there's written communication, there's video, there's loads of things you can do. You cannot be seeing people face to face. In 2019, when we rolled out this, the, the, the last vi uh, sort of vision, we had a conference when we bought all of the sort of managers from the US across for it face to face to make them feel a real part of it. And it was brilliant to see them, you know, and that's why it's difficult at the moment. You know, we've got, we've got an office in Philly. I've never been to Philly and we've had an office no. there nearly a year. We're opening Tampa in June. You know, I, I was supposed to be going there 12 months ago on a recce. It's a tough gig that I know, but um, I know, so I know. It, yeah, it's hard, you know, and it's even hard for Kevin who runs the U S to get, you know, he was in Philly the other day and he drives three hours each way to get to Austin from his home in Houston. And it's difficult. Um, but I, I think if you've got leaders and, and senior people within each of the locations that buy into the same values again, I keep going on about that and the environment, the culture, it, you should go to see people. And you, you should show them they're important, but you don't need to because yeah. you've got the same message. And I think it's having that, that group and there's layers of groups, right? It's having that group all on one same page and knowing that they can rely on each other as well because – you know, Kyle, who's who's a lead consultant in Philly, could definitely help um, Evan, who's a lead consultant in London, with something and the other way around. And it's trying to trying to give people more access to this, trying to create. You know, I don't want to, You don't have meetings for the sake of it, but you know, look at things like task forces and and, and groups where they, they can really leverage off each other's um, skill set processes. The stuff that won't be applicable, of course, but I, there's no point in knowledge if, if you're not using it. Yeah, totally get that. It's, I think what you've what you've managed to build in the time, I mean, like you say, 14 years might sound like a long time, but I mean, I got into recruitment 10 years ago, 10 years ago, um, and time flies. Um, but what you've got now is a genuine multi-location business that is a, you know, a serious organization you know in in our sector there's not many that reach that that height i suppose of 100 headcount um have you do you ever pat, do you ever sit there and pat yourself on the back do you ever, do you ever genuinely think fucking hell i i know and you've not done it on your own mate but you you came in with a handful of people like do you ever look back and think i'm proud of what i've done i try not to because i, I want to be on my tiptoes all the time um mm. I am always looking, searching for more, and, and I don't think that I'm. I like to think I'm not unreasonable in my in my my quest for that. Uh, you know, I'm not demanding in, to that extent. But I think I think it's a dangerous thing to do. I think having a reflection on stuff and going, yeah, we've done all right, is cool. 
Um, but I think the minute you you stop going forward, you're going backwards, really. Uh, and I, I'm very proud of what we've done. And I'm proud of, of the, the fact that I'm proud of the fact that it's not been linear growth. The fact that we've had that Loch Ness monster thing, you know, and you and you're and, and bit by bit, we're very good at fighting and coming back when we're in a corner. We've got a real good spirit for that. Um, but obviously, you don't want to be in that position in the first place. Um, I, look, I you know I'll I'll, ref, I'll reflect on it more from a, a, a a sense of pride, I think, when I'm done. Um, but um, I, I don't know. I think it's probably more for other people that than me. Um, I'm very invested and very passionate and very ambitious still in, in what we're doing. And I, we, you, you get to a stage in recruitment that you, your um, your motivations change, right? I'm sure. I'm sure they evolve on a consistent basis. I'm lucky enough to be in a state at the moment where I can. I, I'm able, I'm very privileged to be able to do something that I find really fucking cool. And if I didn't, I wouldn't do it. Mm. And I think I, I don't want to really sit there while I'm, while I'm still like that. I don't want to sit there and, and look back too much. I, I just, I, it doesn't work for me. Yes, reflect, try and improve. I don't want to go, oh, aren't we great? We've got 100 staff, whatever, because it doesn't matter because it could come falling down tomorrow. Um, That's, see, that line you just said is so... That resonates so close with me. Like, you know, it could fall apart tomorrow. I think, I don't know, like, I, I think that keeps you on your toes as a leader that you, you know, it's, there's nothing secure forever, is it? Like, you, you, you take your it's, foot off the gas, it, it can start to slide. It, it's not, and, you know, you, you go to, so I, I, I've got a decent network of um, recruitment directors and CEOs now, which I, I don't think I knew one four years ago, and now I know loads. And you sit around the end, the, 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 there's people with, 10 staff 15 staff you listen to them talking you go, fuck me they are really really good mm. you know so th there's two sides that white can lead to a little bit of imposter syndrome because they're looking at you going wow you drive this big ship and you're going I feel like it you know I, just, mm. I do what i do um but on the other side of it i, I think it's got to keep you on your toes because again that innovation thing that is that's caused by competition for me i think a lot and this is no disrespect to larger organizations and we're smack bang in the middle really it's the it's the smaller ones that are agile that come up with really cool solutions that are that are firing in different ways because they they want to get ahead and get a name in it and mm. I think I I take as much inspiration and advice and other things from, from people who run small 10 15 man bands as, as I do the people I know that run that run you know your large corporate recruiters yeah um I, I think middle ground we it's it's one some ways it's one of the best positions to be in because nobody in, in, in our place is a number, but we are strong and we're stable. Uh we we're still able to be a little bit agile. But I think you I think you, you people really want to not be when you're in our position as well. Because yeah. you know, people aren't taking over Randstad tomorrow, are they? And, and getting more stuff in than them. But I think particularly where, where our HQ is in Manchester, I think we're definitely one of the largest independent outfits. And I think you're there to be shot at, and that's a good thing keeps you on your toes you know and i think it's harder to maintain a level of excellence than it is to get there in the first place sometimes oh 100 percent. and it's you've got so much more to lose as well so it's a different mindset what what is the you said you know when you're done you might look back what, what do you have an idea in your head of to what the future looks like for you personally as the leader of the business um not really no um, you know, I, I personally haven't got any aspirations on an exit at a particular point in time. I know from a business perspective, that's 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 really textbook wrong. You know, you should always be looking towards a, a, an exit plan because I'm still really enjoying day to day. Christ, it's challenging. You know, I, I can't I can't blame my baldness on the pandemic. It was way before that, but I've got a hell of a lot more wrinkles now. You know, the crow's feet, and you know, last year, you know, I. I I've been, a bit, I've been a bit overweight for a while. The last year I've put on almost two stone and I'm working really hard at trying to get that down at the moment because that makes me happy. If I'm if I'm mm. fitter and feel stronger and feel, I, I, for some reason, it makes me sharper, a lot sharper mentally as well. And I think, to be honest with you, I'm, whilst I'm in generally, apart from being tubby, uh, in, a, in a good place, I'm not trying to look at anything in terms of, you know, I want to retire when I'm 50 or 60 or what have you. And I, I, I do think that there will come a time where that, that I'll start to look at that. But, you know, I've got two young boys, age, age two and age five. And, I you know, I, I'm not I'm not a, a young man necessarily, but I don't feel I don't feel middle aged. You know, I don't 
I don't act like a 21 year old, but I don't feel like I should be even thinking about that yet. Yeah. I've got a couple of friends recently who are similar age to me and they've recent, both recently sold recruitment businesses and they're set up for life and that's brilliant for them. I couldn't think of anything more scary for me, scare the shit yeah. out of me because I've done this since, since I was straight out of uni. I don't know how to do anything else. Um, and it's my passion and it still is. And it, it, there's still a fire burning beneath, you know, behind my eyes. I think once I start to feel that way and you've got to be really honest with yourself, I think that's when maybe I should consider that maybe that'd be too late. You know, again, maybe that's the wrong thing, but you know, I, I got, I got contacted by quite a well-known sort of leadership coach recently and sent me a message and said, what, what do you think about corporate burnout? You know, when did you just get it? I was like, I'm tired, but I've, I've never, I'm really fortunate. I've never burnt out. It's, it's not I'm this you know, macho superhuman or anything like that. I just haven't, I think because I, I get really turned on by my job every day and it excites me because we're every day we're stepping into the unknown. Yeah. We've never been this, this big before. We've never had these challenges before. So I, how could you not be fucking excited about that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can empathize with that. I think the thought of just not working and, and having the money that on some sides is great. On other sides is like, what, what would you do? Like, yeah. And, and I think if you've got some ridiculous hobbies uh, and a, uh, you know, some people have a life where they're like, yeah, that is what I would spend it on. But if you're the type of person who actually enjoys your job, you like the buzz of the people, yeah. what, yeah. you know, why, why leave? Um, you strike me, it's like a football manager, you know, you, you, while you're winning, while your team's growing, you know, why, why change? But the, we'll all come to a time where we'll probably think there's someone better than us to take over, I imagine. Um, I, I think that's important as well. I, I think, there's got to be a time where, where if you do well, if you, you you step outside and say, I'm not the best person to do this job right now. Mm. Um, I still feel like I'm doing a jo good job and our leadership team is good together. Um, uh, you know, maybe that should be aspirational to, to, to step aside. I think if I was the, the sole owner of the business, that'd be the case, but, um, you know, um, then we'll see. It's exciting. What, if you look back, what's the biggest mistake you've like one mistake you can think you've made in that period, 14 years? I know you've made shitloads because we all have, but something that stands out where you're like, yeah, I would I would do that differently. I've made so many. I think a few a good few years ago, and I've made a lot of mistakes. I think I was slightly afraid of my own shadow for a while, which is rare for me because it generally in life nothing scares me. Um and so uh, there was a sort of situation where I felt like I had to go into my shell a bit to try and um, I, I became very sterile for a year or two. I didn't realise at the time I was then having such less positive effects on the business. It's like anything, right? With with your with your positive traits come flaws. And I think if you just think about your flaws, you, you'll be scared to do the things that, that are positive. And I think there was a couple of years where I I was working hard and I was but I was that that fire had gone. I think that aura had gone from me a little bit, and I'd stopped looking forward. And I was just doing, um, and that that was caused by making mistakes with people and falling out with people. And I, re I quickly realised that I you've got to be authentic and you've got to be true to yourself. And not everybody's going to love that. It's not always going to work. But that doesn't mean you stop doing it. And I think I lost trust in myself for a couple of years. So wow. from a sort of an inherent basis, I would say that would be my biggest mistake. I mean, technically, I'm sure I've buggered up a few deals and things like that, you know, um, and, and, and bugger up managing people in, in certain ways. You look back now and you're like, look, I wish I'd have been able to approach something in a different manner or, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've all got tons of those. Yeah, you, you don't, you can only know what you know at the time and, you know, the only perfect decisions are made in hindsight. Um, Andy, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think the the what I always got, I got from you when I first met you was that just you know normal, humble. You know, you don't you clearly don't have an opinion of yourself. It's like yeah, we're at hundred, so what? Like we're we're just on a journey, and and you're not you. I think you you got you sharp. You got you you're sharpening the blade all the time, knowing the people are watching you, but it's not it's not gone to your head, which is which is brilliant. Um. I'm convinced there'll be people that will reach out to you after listening to this and will want five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe pick your brains. Are you open to that? If someone does reach out, I know you're busy, but if, if someone wanted to ask you a few questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
sometimes sometimes wonder why they do want want to ask me stuff. But yeah, it, it happens. Um, I've I've got friends and strangers who, who do contact me, and I'm always happy to help. I think I think that's a huge important part of of the recruitment from using it itself together. I think we made a big play on it in the last year, and I think there were loads and loads of good um, schemes where people did that. You know, um, and I just hope that now things are going back towards normal. People don't stop doing that. You no, know, I don't really remember that in competition. I, I think she's the important. So yeah, I, you know, I I help people that are competitors, uh, and I've got those that help me as well. It, it goes both yeah. ways for sure. But yeah, but my door's always open. Wicked. Well, you're tagged in everything on on LinkedIn. Um, on on everything that we post, um, mate, it's been a pleasure. I, I want to get you back in in the future when you hit that 150 or that 200 milestone. We'll see. Um, we'll see where you are. I'm sure you won't have changed much by then. Um, and <laughs> we'll uh, we'll get you back on the show, guys. Thank you for listening. For those of you that are listening on the podcast, I do ask always every week the same thing. Please get it out to more people. Share it to people you know. Um, also, if you can give us a rating on Apple iTunes. That would be amazing as well because it allows us to be pushed up the ranks to, to reach more people. Um, I'll be back again next week, next Wednesday. I've got a number of big hitters booked in now until the end of June where we're scheduled for a short break um, to look at revamping and changing a few things for season five. I can't believe I'm on season four. I mean, this is just where the hell has time gone from starting this show? It's been it's been insane. But uh, yeah, we've got some wicked guests booked in every Wednesday from now until the end of June. So please uh, have a really good week. In the meantime, stay safe and I'll see you soon.